Welcome. We appreciate you joining with us to watch this message. We pray it will bless you, that we'll all learn, grow, and become more like Jesus. Let's join in in watching the message at this time. One of the most difficult realities by any parent is letting go of their children. Maybe it's letting go when the first day of kindergarten comes along and it's hard for dad and mom to let them go off to that big world of school. Maybe it's when they're adolescent age and they go off to their first week of camp, summer camp. Maybe it's graduating from high school and then they go off to college. That's another big step. And then of course, especially if your son or daughter's been living at home, and they get married, that is really a tough let go because you know that your world is going to change forever. It'll never be the same again. So letting go of our kids is tough, but letting go of them at inopportune times is worse yet. For example, Tracinda Fox lived in a, an apartment complex in the Bronx. In 2005, the apartment caught fire, or the apartment, building caught fire. Smoke was filling up her apartment and so she opened the window and leaned out to get fresh air. Not only for her, but for her one month old child. And as her apartment continued to fill up with smoke on the third floor, she had to decide what she was going to do with her child. With people standing below, she eventually let go of her son. He fell and was caught by Felix Vasquez, who was a, uh, not a rescue person, he was a housing authority employee, and he had been a former lifeguard, so he did mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and got the little boy gone good again. A few minutes later, the fire department did get to Tracinda's apartment and rescued her, got her down, and the story's got a happy ending because both mother and child were safe. But can you imagine letting go of your child like that. Today we come to what some might consider as a pinnacle in Abraham's life, and definitely a pinnacle in our sermon series on Abraham, that of him having to let go of his son. We're in Abraham's journey of faith, and in this series we've seen how God brought Abraham to this new land, promised him that he would be make him into a great nation, have lots of descendants. And then after 25 years of waiting, Abraham and Sarah finally had their son. But we come to the time that they had to let go of their son. Now we're going to talk about letting go this morning, but it isn't about letting go. It's also about tightening our grip. Tightening our grip on God. Letting loose of the things of this earth and tightening our grip on God. So we're talking about Abraham and the sacrifice that God told him to do of Isaac, his son. One of the most difficult things, I think, that, that God asked of anybody in the Bible. Now, to add a little bit more drama to this, just think about, we talked about Abraham and, and waiting 25 years for this son, but remember last week, they finally had that son. And then... Sarah was jealous of Hagar and her son. If you remember, Sarah suggested, well, since we can't have kids, Abraham, take my maidservant and have a son through her, which of that culture, that was acceptable. So they had that son. But last week, we saw when Isaac was born, now Sarah was jealous of Hagar and Ishmael, and she told Abraham, get that boy and, and his mother out of here. Abraham didn't want to do that, but God said, go ahead, I'm going to make him into a nation too. So Abraham let Hagar and Ishmael go, likely to never see that son again. So Abraham has already lost one son that he loved very, very much. And now God is asking him to give up his other son. Now, as we go through here, something else I want us to notice as we read the scripture, we're going to see several times where God, God talks about Abraham's son, his only son, the son that he loves, talking about Isaac. And we'll come back later and we'll talk about that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22, beginning with 
verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to, Abra to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Now notice here that Abraham identifies Isaac as the boy. How old was Isaac at this time? Well, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But the boy. So was Isaac seven years old? Eight, nine, ten, eleven years old? Can't be too much older than that because, uh, at least in the Israelite culture, uh, boys became men when they reached, uh, I forget, it was 12 or 13 years old. So, calling him a boy. So, not very old. Also notice Abraham's faith. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Now, wait a minute. God said, sacrifice your son, the son that you love, on the altar. That means Isaac is to die. Abraham, he's got faith now. We will come back. Let's go to verse 6. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Now, did you notice in verse 6? We'll go back to verse 5, and Abraham called Isaac a boy. But we go back to verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Okay, so if he's 7 years old, 10, 11 years old, how much wood can an 11-year-old boy carry? How much wood can you carry for a burnt offering? Now, from the farm, uh, we would have animals that would die, and we would try burning some of them, but we learned that if you're going to burn an animal, it takes, a, it takes a brush fire. It takes a big fire to burn an animal. So I don't know how they did their burnt offerings, whether they expected to burn a whole uh, sacrifice or not, but anyway about it, a little boy can't carry much wood. So, so does this mean that maybe Isaac is a little bit older than we're thinking? I mean, Abraham was 100 years old when they had Isaac. Now, if you're 100 years old, uh, a 20-year-old is going to seem like a boy to you. But then we've got to add some years to Isaac. So if, I, if, if Abraham is 110 or 120, that makes Isaac pretty young, no matter how you look at it. So the, what I'm getting at is here, always... Look at the context of the passage. Whereas one passage talks like Isaac was a, quite a little boy, this passage, if Isaac is carrying the wood, he has to be old enough to carry the wood. And then later we're going to read that Abraham bound his son, Isaac. So keep the context. It still doesn't give us any answers, but evidently he wasn't just this little boy like what it sounded like at first. But whatever age or size, he was old enough to carry the wood, keep things in its context. But notice the faith that Abraham has also. When Isaac asked, well, what, what about the, 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 the lamb? What, what's gonna, and, and Abraham says, God's going to provide. Abraham doesn't seem too concerned about this situation. Let's go on to verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, 
what was going through Abraham's mind. Now we read in Hebrews that in chapter 11 that Abraham was supposing that God could bring Isaac back to life. But still, dads, can you, can you even imagine this? I mean, we don't even want to imagine this. We, we've seen paintings of Abraham about to slay his son. My guess is his hands would have been shaking. His whole body was probably quivering. Not being able to fathom himself what he was about to do. But this man who had so little faith that would pass Sarah off as a sister so he could save his own life to the Egyptians and to the Philistines. This man that didn't have enough faith that God was going to bring about the promised son through he and Sarah. This man all at once has a lot of faith. And that's commendable. But to do this act that he was about to do is something I don't even want to think about. Chapter 22, verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. I doubt if Abraham heard any sweeter words than that when the angel called out for him to stop. But notice in the middle of verse 12. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. I thought God knew everything. Doesn't he? Yes. God knew that Abraham would carry through with this. God knew at that time Abraham finally had the faith, but Abraham didn't know that. And I don't think any of us would know that until it came to that moment either. I, you know, for, for God to ask us to do the same thing, I couldn't answer that question. What would I do? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, but God do that? And so this wasn't for God to know what Abraham would do. This was for Abraham to know what Abraham would do. And maybe God puts us through a test, not only for us to know, but maybe for somebody else to know what our faith is. We don't know, but this is a very, very tough situation. And so Abraham and Isaac would both return to the servants and Sarah. Verse 13. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Isaac had asked, Father, what about the... What about the, uh, the lamb? God will provide. And he did. God will provide. Dads, I want you to think about this just a little bit. Put yourself in Abraham's place. God calls you to, to sacrifice your son you've waited 25 years for. I don't know if he would have told Sarah what he was going to do. So she probably didn't know about this. So you go off. You go through this incident, how do you go back and tell your wife, guys? How does Sarah understand this? How would you understand it, wives? Sometimes we read these Bible stories and we don't put ourselves in their place. Yeah, they're fun to read, they're exciting to read, but what would it be if it was us, the difficulty that we would face? Well, a powerful story, and it has a happy ending. But what are we to, go, to do with this? How are we to respond with this? Well, let's start by asking yourself a question. How can I please God? You know, let, Don't go any farther there, Craig. Let's just stick with that right there. How can I please God? Have you ever asked yourself that question? 
Yesterday, for the first time ever, I asked myself that question. I, I got up, got around, I got the day planned. I've got to go through the sermon a few times. I've got to do some yard work, some things around the house. So I've got my day all planned. And then I remembered this question. How can I please God? And I got ready to pray that question to God. How can I please you? And I stopped. You know why I stopped? Because I wondered what it was going to cost me. I had my day planned. And I literally had to stop and think before I prayed this prayer. Now, I prayed it again today, which was a little bit easier. I don't have the day planned as much. Once I get through this morning, I'm kind of floating. But this is a question we need to ask ourselves every day. How can I please you, God? Well, we can start by let go of everything but God. Let go of everything but God. Now, does this mean that we live neglectfully? No, no. We are to still love our fellow man and woman and human being. We're to be faithful. We're to live godly lives. But it does mean that we loosen our grip on some things. Loosen our grip on our homes and our things in the homes and the toys that we have and the vehicles that we have. Loosen our grip on our money and our investments. Even loosen our grip on our spouses and our children. Now, that's tough. I know it is. Jesus told his followers, and this is not on the screen, Luke chapter 14, verse 26. He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, are we to take this literally? No, it's hyperbole. If you remember the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your right eye is a problem, pluck it out. He doesn't mean this literally. He's meaning, look, if, you, if something is causing you to sin, do whatever it takes to correct that. And what Jesus is saying is, let go. Loosen your grip on these things of the world, these things that you love the most. And what do we love the very most? It's our own life. And Jesus is saying, you've got to let go of that also. Abraham proved his deep, deep love for God by letting go of his son, Isaac. And therefore, each of us are to tighten our grip on God's hand. Now, now we're, we're putting this in first person so that you can hopefully take your bulletin and stick it to the medicine cabinet so you can read this every morning. How can I please God? Well, I let go of everything but God. I tighten my grip on God's hand. There's a story that's told about an, an elderly gentleman that needs to, he's in a foreign country, needs to cross this really busy street. There's cars and buses and trucks going past fast. There's no intersection to cross, no lights. He's got to get to the other side. So he prays to God, God, may I hold your hand while I cross the street? And God answers him. He says, no, you may not. The guy startled. That's kind of hard-hearted, God. What are you talking about? Well, God continued. But I can hold your hand. You see, if, if you hold my hand, you may let go when you get scared in the middle of the street, and then you're going to get hurt. But let me hold your hand, and I'll get you safely across. Well, that's a, that's a nice story, but there's more to it than just that, because we are to hold God's hand. We are to hold on to God tightly. And when we do, he holds on to our hand tightly. How are we to do this? Well, figuratively speaking, we trust him. We love him. We obey him. We live godly lives. And when we hold on to his hand, he's going to hold on to ours, and he's not going to let go. If we get frightened, he will still hold on to us. Now, there is a catch, though. If we decide we don't want to hold on to God's hand, he'll let go of ours, too. He's not going to force us to stay with him. I mean, think about who you love. 
you you want them to love you back. You want this to be a relationship that goes both ways. And if they don't love you, it's really difficult to love the other person. This is what God wants. God wants us to love him. He wants us to take hold of his hand as a child takes a hold of a parent's hand, and then he will hold on to our hand. But if as a child we want to jerk free and say, I don't want you anymore, God. I want to hold tightly to the things of this world and let loose of you, God will do it. It'll break his heart. But he will honor our wishes. So how do we hold tightly onto God's hand? Well, there's a lot of different ways, but in keeping in uh, correspondence with what we're talking about today, we do this by strengthen our faith in God. Strengthen my faith in God. When we looked at Abraham these past several weeks, we saw how he didn't have much, if any, faith in God. Save his own life. She's my, she's my sister. She's not my wife. Let's, let's propagate a son by the servant woman. And there's several things you could see in Abraham's life that was all about himself. All about, number one, Abraham. And it, it was their culture. But now Abraham had a firm grip in God. And had this deep faith in God. Well, how did he get there? Oh, he got there by getting through the temptations of Satan, sometimes making mistakes, sometimes doing it right, sometimes sinning, sometimes not sinning. He did it by God testing him. Sometimes he failed, sometimes he passed the test. And see, this is how you and I develop our faith also. We go through these temptations of Satan, we go through the testing of God. Now, those are different. God does not tempt us to sin, but he does test us to test our faith in him. And when we go through these trials, when we fail, hopefully we learn, and when we do what's right, we pass the test, hopefully we grow, and it strengthens our faith then in God also. See, God wants a relationship with us, and we cannot have a relationship at an arm's length. Think about yourself. In my life, I can think of people that I can be with them for an an hour or two, and that's about all of them that I can take at a time because our personalities really, really clash. Maybe they're uh, using language that's really not godly language, and you're glad that you're kind of away from them after a bit. So those those people, although we're supposed to latch on to them and love them, our personalities want to keep them a little bit of an arm's length. There's other people, and maybe you do this with couples, that you and your spouse, and you get together with somebody else and their spouse, and they say, hey, let's go for this weekend thing, and you, you go, and you get back from the weekend, you had a lot of fun, but then you tell your, your wife or husband, well, I'm glad that's over with, we'll, we'll do it again next year, but I, I, I need this break for the entire year. And so you're kind of holding them at an arm's length also. And then there's the other people that you just click. I mean, you think alike, they inspire you, you inspire them, they, they make you think differently, and, and, and you're kind of on the same line of things, and you just love being around them. Oh, hopefully, we just defined your spouse. So hopefully, that, that kind of relationship is there. But this is the intimate relationship that God wants. We can't have an intimate relationship with God at an arm's length. And the way that we strengthen that relationship is by trusting God. The tests that he puts us through, we go through them and we pass. And then we learn to step out on faith ourselves. When we know that there's something that we need to do, we step out on faith, no matter how scary it is, and we do it for God. Sometimes we complete it, sometimes we don't. But stepping out in faith, stepping out in faith with God. He wants that relationship with us. So how did, how did this offering go and so forth? Well, we know that Abraham was going to go through with it. We know that God stopped him, and we know that God provided a lamb. So let's keep on reading here. Verse 15. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. 
Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Now, Abraham could not have fully understood what God was telling him here. But you and I can because we've got 2020 vision as we've looked back. Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. Isaac begat Esau and Jacob. And as God said, the older son would serve, brother would serve the younger. So Jacob's the one that carried on the promise of God. Jacob had 12 sons. And those 12 sons by means became the 12 tribes of Israel, which became the nation of Israel, which Jesus came but to us by the nation of Israel. Through Abraham. The blessing of all nations was Jesus Christ, is Jesus Christ to us. But before we continue, let's go back to verse 16. I, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that this, this, your, the son, your only son, let's go back to verse 16 again. He says, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and, and have not withheld your son, your only son. Now, th does that ring a bell with anything else in the Bible? Maybe something in the New Testament? Maybe. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God gave Jesus. Abraham gave his only son. God gave his only son. Now, here's some interesting things. While the Bible, I don't think, ever does come out and say that Abraham and Isaac is a uh, forerunner prophecy of what God and Jesus was going to do, but there's a lot of parallels, and they're really evident. That mountain, Mount Moriah, where Abraham sacrificed Isaac or was about to, is the exact same mountain that God sacrificed Jesus on. Maybe the exact same spot. We don't know. Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice to the mountain. Jesus carried the wood for the sacrifice to the mountain. Abraham had Isaac on the altar and God stopped him and provided a substitute sacrifice. You and I were the ones that were supposed to be on that cross. And God provided the alternate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And as you go down through this, the, the, the two stories of Abraham and Isaac and of God and Jesus, the parallels are just so much in line with each other. The question for us today, though, is, how can we please God? How can I please God? Well, we please Him by letting go of everything but God. Loose our grip on everything in this world, even our life. And then tighten our grip on God's hand. And then strengthen our faith in God by developing that faith. So those of us that are Christians... How well are we doing at pleasing God? If you're like me, you're falling way short in many areas. Hey, we're doing good in a lot of areas. But there's probably a lot of other areas that we could do a lot better in. So we need to ask ourselves this question. How can I please God? How can I do better? What, where am I failing at? And what can I do to, to really make Him smile on us? And then for those that might be outside of Christ... You don't have a tight grip on God at all. Matter of fact, you can't unless you're a Christian, a follower. And how do we get that tight grip? Well, it's a process of time because as you see, the Christians even, we sometimes don't have a very tight grip. The first step is to repent and be baptized. Become a Christian. A follower of Jesus Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, I think this is probably 
one of those Bible stories that none of us wants to be partakers in. None of us wants to imagine, oh, we could do that because I don't think any of us could. Well, I don't know. I, I can't answer that for myself and I can't answer for anybody else. All I know is it'd have to be the, the toughest thing that Abraham ever had to do in his life. So Father, give us, give us the courage to loosen our grip on things of earth, even our most cherished things, our spouses and our children. Give us the courage to tighten our grip on you and then to step out in faith. Yes, to pass those temptations that Satan throws at us and pass those tests that you throw at us, but to step out in faith and to say, God, I trust you to carry me through this, whatever it might be. Make us stronger. Make us bold in you. Help us to hold you tight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching the message. If we can help you in any way, we ask that you please contact us. Check us out on our website at roscopchurch.org. You can find the information there, how to contact us. We'd love to hear from you, talk with you, and help you in your walk with Jesus. Thank you once again for joining with us.